Hey, Kurt. How's it going? Good, Laura. Good morning. Good, good afternoon. Yeah, good, good evening, morning, wherever good you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's get started. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm really happy to have Kurt Peterson here with me today to talk about kind of this relationship that um, Scrum and Kanban have with each other. And so I, I think the content will be great. Uh, we are recording the session. So we will share the recording and the deck um, at the end of this. It'll, it'll probably take me a day to get that uploaded, but we'll share that with everybody who has joined. Uh, the other thing I'd ask is if you have questions as we go along, it's uh, really helpful for me if you put them into the Q&A. Um, if you end up putting them in the chat, no worries. Um, there's no wrong way to do it, but we really do like to see your questions as you think of them. If I can weave them into the conversation as we go along, I will certainly pose them to Kurt when it, when it feels like the right time. But uh, we, we will take all of the questions and um, incorporate some answers into our follow-up email as well. So it's not a waste of time to give us a question, even if we don't have enough time to get to it today. All right, so um, my name is Laura Richardson. I actually run um, sales and, and marketing and business development for Applied Frameworks. And uh, I, I enjoy these sessions that I'm having with our senior consultants and principal consultants because I, I learn a lot too as I hear from our experts in the organization talk about areas that they're passionate about. Um, Kurt Peterson is probably, um, well, he's definitely the biggest expert I know in Kanban, and he's got a lot of passion in leveraging the capabilities and skills there with um, Scrum. And so uh, I think I'll stop talking at this point and let Kurt take over from here. But Kurt, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Uh, excited to be here and, and talk about something I really enjoy talking about. I'm really going to focus in three areas. I want to give a little bit of uh, origin and context for the way that I'm thinking about Scrum and Kanban sort of side by side. Uh, and then I'll share a little bit of my personal experience, you know, uh, how I came to Kanban from Scrum. Um, and then lastly, just talk about applications of, of Kanban and the Kanban lens within a Scrum setting. And then we're going we're gonna to have some time at the end of this um, for, for some conversation as well. So just briefly, um, I was born and raised in Texas. Uh, I was, I've been in Charlotte, North Carolina, or in that region for the last uh, roughly 10 years. And in, in March, I migrated uh, along with my wife and family up to Calgary. She was born in Saskatchewan in a small town called Moose Jaw. So I'm, I'm making my way uh, towards Canadian citizenship. And uh, this is, the pandemic sort of catalyzed a lot of this. Um, but I'm excited to be able to present and kind of talk to you from a really cool city and a really cool setting. Um, just the, the briefly, the arc of my career, I used to be a software engineer for six years. I wrote code at NASA and IBM, and then I moved into project management where I was doing a lot of conventional, uh, you could say waterfall projects for about six years. And then I came across the Agile Manifesto and I brought Ken Schwaber to Austin, Texas, and then the basement of uh, the Driscoll Hotel in downtown Austin, uh, Ken Schwaber invited me to join him to teach. And, and I kind of you know, turned my head sideways and I said, Ken, why do you want me to come teach with you? I, I know every way not to do Agile, not to do Scrum. And, and Ken said, well, that's the perspective that I need in my classroom because I, I'm swimming in this stuff. My students are not. So they began about a four month relationship where I apprenticed with Ken. Um, I brought a um, kind of a sensibility in adult learning to his work, made it interactive, and, uh, and he educated me the whole time. So it was a really good partnership that set me on my path as an agile coach and trainer, which is really what I've been doing the last 15 years. Um, so I, I want to kind of start by just talking about my, my take on agile and I mean, scrum and Kanban. And I, I want to start with a theory. I wonder if Scrum and Kanban could have been separated at birth, or maybe maybe not separated at birth, maybe toddlerhood. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, stories. I read an article in uh, online in Pocket the other day, and uh, it it, the title of the article was when, when a DNA test shatters your identity. And I suspect if we submitted some DNA testing from both of these toddlers in front of you, I think we'd get some surprising results back, possibly a surprising paternity result back. So this is gonna kind of be a, a theme for the next couple of slides. We'll see what you think as we move along. Um, Gartner, Gartner back in 2015, they, they did a, a really beautiful rendition of, of what we call the Agile Family Tree. Um, it starts in 1995, but actually the, the roots of Agile 
stretch back to 1950 and the Toyota production system. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this particular slide because I want to move you into sort of what I'm sort of what I'm seeing as agile and what I talk about when I'm saying agile, because um, that, that's what's going to be relevant to our conversation today. Um, but this slide will be out part, as part of the presentation. We'll be sending these out and you'll have access to it. Um, I spent six months at an aerospace company uh, in the southeast and my last week there, a woman who was the enterprise tooling person, she was, you know, the person that handled JIRA and Confluence and all these tools, she was getting ready to present on tools. And she asked, she said, you know, Kurt, um, can you come on just for a few minutes and talk about Agile? And, and I asked her, I said, okay, I can do that. Um, how much time do I have? She said, three minutes. I said, okay, three minutes and how much, uh, how many slides? Because I'm, I'm kind of a slide fanatic. She says, you have one slide, three minutes. So this is what I landed on. This is my Agile in a nutshell. So when I talk about Agile, I'm, uh, and, and I'm really kind of pointing to this as the, the reason that we might adopt Scrum or Kanban, is, is to bring these uh, areas of organizations into partnership. So business and IT, uh, my friend Brendan Wavchko calls this makers and st uh, stakeholders and makers. Uh, you might think of it as product and development, but these two are in partnership. And at the center of their partnership is people, which are customers for whom products and services are being built and delivered. And there's a, there's a focus in whatever camp you're on, there's an agile focus on value. So value tends to take a couple forms. It can be monetary, it can be cost savings or return on investment, uh, revenue generation. Uh, it could be learning. Uh, the early days of Airbnb, the early days of Amazon, um, there was a lot of learning that was paid for and it was valuable. Um, and lastly, I'm, I'm a recovering project manager and I'm always thinking about risk. And so how do we drive down risk? That can represent a good form of value as well. And we're doing this in small batches, small tasty batches ideally. There's a the cake, a slice of cake, and we're doing it with feedback from our customers, stakeholders, and markets. And we're doing it in, in teams that we're enabling to self-organize. So, so my Agile in a nutshell, is business and IT or product and dev working together with a focus on customer needs and delivering value incrementally with steady feedback in self-organizing teams. So this is the basis um, for Scrum and Kanban kind of uh, being brought into organizations to increase agility or to adopt um, Agile. When I say Agile, this is what I am talking about. So let's talk about these, these two methods, these two approaches, Scrum and Kanban, because they're rooted in different places. Uh, Scrum is rooted in product development. So the new new product development game was published in 1986, and it was about com companies in Japan who were seeking to accelerate time to market, or actually decrease time to market, accelerate innovation. And they found that one way to do this was to take people out of their day-to-day -day jobs, put them in a cross-functional team, and give them some tie boxes within which to collaborate. So product development is really the taproot of Scrum. Um, the taproot of Kanban is manufacturing. And it's the Toyota production si system and Taichi Ono looking for a, a more efficiency, but also a more humane way of working, uh, honoring and respecting the individuals and their skills um, and really increasing flow. So when I think of Scrum, the first thing that comes to mind for me is, how do I, am I increasing innovation here? Am I getting a group of diverse people together, putting them into a time box, and I'm doing that because I want them to innovate and collaborate more effectively together. When I think about Kanban, I think about, am I creating a sense of a shared, a shared picture into the way work is moving? And am I giving us some tools and, and ability to kind of create flow, uh, identify where work is being blocked, and then help it to flow? So these are the different roots of each of these areas. Um, so Scrum has one sort of root or origin, and Kanban has another. Now, what's common is Taichi Ono, who is the father of the Toyota production system back in the 50s. Um, would it be worthwhile to submit a paternity test for Taichi Ono to Scrum and Kanban? I think it could be. And I think we could be a little surprised by the results. I'll leave you with that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how I came to Kanban and kind of what it felt like. So um, there's a lot of discussion around uh, the Kanban lens. 
you know, Andy Carmichael is a, is a, um, the co-author of the Essential Kanban book with David Anderson, and he, he's written a lot about the Kanban lens. It's a way of seeing work and a way of seeing things. So I, I kind of decided to play on that, and I thought about my own arrival on the scene as a scrum practitioner considering Kanban, and this is sort of what I landed on. This is, um, it's a little bit like the opening of a James Bond movie. It's that sort of gun barrel view, but I think of it also as a camera aperture. Uh, Scrum really has an emphasis on roles, events, and artifacts. What you're looking at now is a potentially releasable product increment. It's, a, it's one of the key essential artifacts in Scrum. Um, another sort of part of the substance of Scrum is the daily Scrum and the development team, which is a fundamental role, meeting every day. Um, another, I say, viewpoint on Scrum is refinement and the backlog and the product owner. So Scrum has these roles, events, and artifacts that when I first came to them, they were very compelling because they were a bit familiar. Uh, I don't have a Gantt chart. I have a product backlog. Um, I, I don't have uh, status meetings. There's a daily Scrum meeting that I go to to support the development team and planning. Um, so Scrum has some, a level of substance that I think all of us or a lot of us find compelling. It has, it has roles, events, and artifacts. You can draw a diagram of Scrum. You can kind of point to things. You can speak about it. This diagram you're looking at here is from uh, my friend Valerio uh, Zanini, and, and he, he sketched this out. He's an Italian. He's very much an artist. And um, this is his, his Scrum diagram. We, we certainly have some other play frameworks that are as functional, but I don't think quite as beautiful. Um, but, but Scrum has a nice, uh, it's, it's framed well, it's got uh, the right amount of uh, visuals, it's not too cluttered. So it has, it has a lot of allure to it in terms of kind of capturing our imagination. I came to Kanban in 2015 after, you know, a, a really, I took a three-year sabbatical from the industry starting in 2012. I actually relocated to China and lived in a, a Taoist monastery for uh, uh, about a y six months and trained in Tai Chi and learned to, to teach Tai Chi actually. So when I came back, I, was, uh, I landed at a, a financial services company in the Southeast and I suddenly had three teams to manage. And as you, many of you know, when you have three teams to manage, you've got to start talking about multi-team scrum or scaling scrum. So that's what brought me to Kanban and Stephen Martin is a, is a uh, I think he moved, has moved to Austin now, and uh, he, he's a colleague and a mentor of mine in the world of Kanban. But what Kanban did for me was it really zoomed out this picture from Scrum and asked me to start to think and consider other things. So it had this notion of flow. So in flow, um, we're looking at how does work move and how do we help it move better, move more effectively, more efficiently. And in Kanban, we talk about upstream in Scrum, we have the product backlog, and anything that's I kind of call to the left of the product backlog is upstream of the product backlog. And similarly, there's a downstream component. So we're starting to kind of take Scrum, and we're zooming out, and we're kind of considering the system. So Scrum teams are part of a bigger ecosystem, and there's things and people and, and deliverables happening downstream, and there's things happening upstream. And then there was this notion of an option pool. I'm like, man, what is an option pool? Well, it's a product backlog. Now, mature Scrum teams are going to recognize the product backlog as an option pool. New Scrum, Scrum teams may try to treat the product backlog as the golden sort of tablet of requirements. And so they won't think in terms of options, but Kanban has that language sort of built in. So it really, it really opened my eyes to what it means to manage a product backlog as a, a series of options. Um, there's this notion of discovery, discovery, which is upstream, happens upstream, discover the right thing to build. Now, many scrum teams do discovery, but they may or may not explicitly call it discovery as Kanban does. Um, demand analysis was, was a, a huge thing as well. Uh, the idea that different requests are coming at us from different types of stakeholders, and we can actually begin to categorize those. We can look for patterns of demand, and we can learn to allocate our time and our people according to the demands that we want to meet over a given month or a quarter or year. So demand analysis was a big eye-opener for me as a Scrum practitioner. Um, the other uh, radical notion was this notion of demand shaping. Um, wow, you mean I can shape demand? 
because uh, as a scrum master, as a product owner, I always felt like things were just coming at me and I really can't do anything with them. Um, so I'm gonna pause here and I have a few more things on this slide, but I wanna see if Laura has anything she wants to add or if anyone has questions. Um, yeah, you know, this is, um, this is great, uh, Kurt. I'm really glad that I'm hosting this webinar. <laughs> um, so I know that we're going to talk about this as we go a little further in, but, uh, you know, the questions coming up around time boxing, right? Meaning Kanban is like this continuous flow and Scrum has these, you know, um, points in time where something happens and you start over again. And so as you go through this, if you could start to talk a little bit about the differences and how you think about time boxing with Kanban and Scrum, um, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. I'll jot that down and I'll, I'll, I'll keep that in mind as we move through. And just briefly, yeah, Kanban operates outside of, I, I, I was going to say outside of time. In some ways, that's true. Um, there's no time boxes. There are cadence. There are cadences in Kanban. There are feedback loops in Kanban. There is a period, uh, let's see, there's a big word here, Laura, and if, if I get it wrong, tell me, uh, per periodicity, period. Per Periodic uh, inspection points. <laughs> um, well, you think I'm smarter than I really am because I've never said that word out loud, Kurt. So <laughs> you're braver than I am. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, it's good timing though because in Kanban we do have a service delivery review. So we look at how our services, how how what we're producing are landing on our customers, and are they meeting the needs of our customers. Um, one of the one of the things that's interesting about Kanban is this notion of of thinking of what we do as a service. So what are the needs of our customers, and how do we fulfill them in terms of being and feeling and looking like. Uh, looking through the lens of being a service as opposed to we make widgets and we ship widgets and we assume that by the time the widget lands in the customer's hands they're going to be happy with what we built. Now I'm not going to say scrum teams do that categorically but new people coming from scrum because of the emphasis on roles events and artifacts we can lose sight of our customers. That can happen. Right and and I think that also gets into like I mean you know this, there's a question that just came up about you know how does this fit into the agile methodology well, there's, you know, you've talked about this a number of times, but it's like, you know, customer interaction, right, is really the, the emphasis is placed on that. And I think you've talked a lot about, okay, well, how does that um, connection with the customer get incorporated into how the team works? Yes. Yes. And, and right I know on, that, Laura. you know, if you look at the, um, you know, the, the agile methodology, you know, all of those principles that are discussed in there, I think the combination of Scrum and Kanban allows for teams to actually practice or to live those um, agile values and principles in, in various ways. And the customer one just happened to be an obvious one that we could point to given what you were talking about. Yes, yes. And thank you, Laura, because, you know, really at the end of the day, delivering value to customers and, and, and helping the team do it in a sustainable way where they're engaged, uh, th that's really what we're driving towards. That's our destination. I think when we get too fixated on the practices of Scrum or the philosophy of Kanban, we're, we're sort of focusing on the vehicle that, that we want to take us to the destination instead of focusing on the destination. So thank you for bringing that back into focus because it really is about value delivery to our customers in a way that's sustainable. Um, and Kanban's a vehicle, Scrum's a vehicle. You might pull parts from Scrum and Kanban, make your own vehicle, and get, get to your destination in a way that works for your, your organization. Um, operations review is an interesting uh, um, cadence in Kanban. It's, it's typically done uh, quarterly or maybe monthly, and it's looking at um, an end customer that's being met by multiple teams delivering some component of, of what that customer needs. So it's, it's a way to look across teams at a high level, which is what I really like. It's, it's one of the aspects of Kanban that I think is, is really cool. And certainly when you, you look at multi-team Scrum, there's gonna be uh, places that offer that similar thing, but Kanban doesn't necessarily prescribe a time box, so you can do that whenever you want. Um, and lastly, I wanna say a strategy review. Is the product we're delivering meeting the strategy of our enterprise, of our organization. Strategies at large companies, they tend to go be kind of annual, maybe biannual, um, I'm sorry, maybe semi-annual, but typically years long. So we wanna look quarterly at least at our, you know, our results, our data, and, and, and see if it's meeting the strategy of our organization. Um, so uh, let me pause. Any, any last questions or comments on this, either Laura or any, any participants? 
Well, there's um, we're we're getting there's a couple of questions again around the cadence of things because I I think the maybe the simplicity of Scrum in prescribing time boxes helps people understand, for example, when do we have um, intentional interaction with the customer, right? Um, when do we have um, kind of the, an intentional maybe release of value, which is I think what the, the sprint allows teams to think about is at the end of the sprint, we release value. And maybe um, you could talk a little bit more about if you don't have these sprint um, kind of time boxes, we still have this idea that we need to interact regularly with the customer and we need to deliver value on a regular cadence as well. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Laura. So, so the service delivery review is comparable to the sprint review in Scrum. I would say the difference is the service considers not just the product or the increment of the solution that's been built, but how the solution is being, uh, I would say, absorbed, uh, assimilated, used, and, and ideally value generated within the customer's environment. So it's, uh, you know, Matt Phillip wrote a, a beautiful um, blog on uh, service delivery review, the missing event in, in Scrum. Um, and he really paints a, a really cool picture of, of the importance of considering not just the increment, the product, but really how it's being uh, received and is it meeting um, the real-time needs of our customer base. So service delivery review is that opportunity, the SDR, to actually um, get that feedback loop going that drives both improvements of our process, but then also improvement of the product. Thank you. Um, so comment in a nutshell, I want to I want to just kind of paint a, a, a brief picture with a couple bullet points. Um, Kanban's a system. So it's a system of principles and practices and really valuables, va va values as well. Um, and it's a system, it's a means of, of optimizing workflow at, at the start or, or kind of in, in the most fundamental basic way. But it's a way of optimizing value delivery um, as you grow and mature as an organization. And it can be seen also as a way of surviving intensely turbulent times because um, it gives you a sense of is what we're creating and producing as an organization fit for the purpose of our customers and the market. Now let's talk a little bit about the board because that's what we tend to fixate on. The board is the most visible part of Kanban. In, in Kanban, the board represents or the columns represent activities in our work process. Now this board could exist at the team level. It could exist at the program level. It, you could have a CEO of a 10,000 person company with the Kanban board and he could have initiatives being mapped out visually um, but and and as those initiatives went through the cycles, probably week month long cycles, they would move across her board or his board. Um, cards, tickets, features, service requests, those are in the leftmost column, and those are pulled across the board as capacity allows for them. And team process policies govern how and when a card moves across the board. So we begin to get explicit about how we want to work together. That's one of the, the things that, an example of that in Scrum, we have a definition of done. And, and a good Scrum team is gonna have a written definition of done that they all kind of look at and agree on. A, a mature Kanban team is gonna have process policies that are very similar to the definition of done in terms of it's, it's a shared agreement, a shared understanding, and it has some rigor to it. Um, and lastly, uh, in Kanban on the board, we, we limit work in progress. So the, um, we have a managed commitment point so we have a, we have a, a vertical line in our, on our board that says to the left of this line we're doing discovery, and to the right of it we're doing delivery. So we're going to have a very tightly managed commitment point, um, and then in the delivery stream or delivery side of things, we're going to have a, a way to signal when there's capacity to pull new work into the system. So when I think about Kanban, those are sort of the three um, key el three key elements. There's more elements, um, but those are the three key that really jump out at me. Um, I'm going to stop here and see if anyone has thoughts or questions. Um, I, there are no open ones at the moment, but I, I know what's coming. So carry on and, and we'll get deeper into this. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. <laughs> so let's, let's talk practically. Where, where can Scrum teams apply Kanban? Uh, and this is, it starts with visualizing work, but there's much more to, to a comma. It's actually a system, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, delivery, so inside of a sprint, um, it's rare to find a scrum team that is not visualizing their work at some level 
in, in, in the delivery cycle. So I'm, I'm kind of calling that the, the sprint or the sprint build cycle, I'm, I'm, I'm making that synonymous with delivery. Um, another place that scrum teams might apply Kanban is upstream of the product backlog. So product owners are working with a lot of stakeholders usually, and a lot of ideas come at them and they have to make choices. So if you, if you can visualize how you're making the, doing that vetting, doing that, that refinement, you can actually create a, or leverage Kanban to visualize the flow of intake. Intake management is another way to think about discovery. How do we get stuff from stakeholders' brains and the market customers and our salespeople and get those through a funnel gradually so that we can either decide to do them and put them in the product backlog or discard them? Um, and then last and sort of most obvious way or another obvious way that scrum teams could leverage Kanban was when they have a potentially shippable product increment and there's, there's some remaining work to do, some undone work, as we say in, in scrum and, and tracking that undone work and, or tracking the feature as it moves through deployment to get to production can be really useful and it can kind of bridge uh, application development with operations. So it can be a real valuable kind of uh, bridge building uh, mechanism for them. Uh, so, any questions so on this Kurt, diagram? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so here's an interesting question. I think the um, all right. So I'm I'm. This is Laura speaking, and I may be um, not well informed either. Okay. Um, I'm not. But but I'm thinking that the one of the reasons for adopting agile frameworks, regardless of the one that you're picking, is to optimize throughput of value through the system in order to get something valuable into the hands of the customer as quickly as possible. So working on a, a very large chunk of work that's not properly sliced up into small chunks is actually not good for anybody, not good for the team, not good for the yeah. customer. You know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, those kinds of bottlenecks are bad. So is it true that teams who are using Kanban don't actually estimate the chunks of work um, or do they estimate them differently? And, and not knowing everything about everything, I would just say, no, of course they have to estimate the size of the work that they're putting into their Kanban queue because otherwise you're gonna stick something on there that takes six months to deliver, which is not good for the customer. So how yeah. do you think about um, chunking up work into the right size in order to be valid to be in a Kanban workflow? Yeah, so in, in, it's a great question, Laura. In, in Kanban, we preserve that value orientation. So we want the, the queue, the ready, ready to work queue is the equivalent sort of of the sprint backlog, so to speak. Um, we want that to be loaded up with, with customer uh, work items that are of value to our customers. <clears throat> so we wanna decompose those, the, the, the requests and understand the requests so that they're small enough to move across the board and get into customers' hands as quickly as possible. So there's a shared f uh, emphasis on value in both Scrum and Kanban. And there's also, a, a, I think, a shared um, focus on decomposing work into small pieces that can actually drive learning and deliver value. So, so th that's again where I feel like they're much more siblings than they are, uh, maybe they're rival siblings, but they're still siblings. They're still, it's still the same DNA. It's still Taichi Ono talking through, through me, through all of us. Um, now about estimation, um, you know, the first Kanban, uh, first team I helped adopt Kanban, I had them do story point estimation. Like we went through the same process of estimating the backlog or, or in Kanban, we call it the option pool. What most people that have been in Kanban for a while recognize is the process of estimating, the conversation it drives can be valuable, but the data it generates is not as, as, as reliable or interesting as just tracking the cycle time. So cycle time is a Kanban term that says when something enters a system, we commit to do it, and then it exits the system and it goes to our customers, how long does that take? And let's look at that longitudinally. Let's look at, let's look at that over the last month, the last quarter, the last year, and based on that empirical data, you can make a forecast moving forward. So I'd say, I'd say certain Kanban teams are going to maybe size with t-shirt sizes, but maybe really mature Kanban teams are going to be div slicing up the work into small chunks and, and just letting it move through the system so they would, they would be able to you know, use that, that historical data to make a forecast. Uh, does, that, does that help, Laura? It does. It does. And I, um, so uh, maybe, okay, another question I'll pose here and then I'll, I'll let you carry on is um, Kanban could be used by scrum masters and product owners to develop the product backlog was the question. And as I thought about that when you were talking, 
one 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 dimension that I might be tempted to use it for is to prepare um, stories for the backlog so that they can be pulled in by a sprint team, right? Are they, um, have yes. you achieved the de definition of ready yet? So there could be yeah. a little Kanban board right there to say, look, this story isn't ready yet. And so what do we need to do and who's taking ownership of that so that when it is being ready to pull into the, the sprint, we already have confidence that it's ready for the team to work on. Yes. Yes, beautiful. And, and that's exactly another name for the discovery board here is, is I, I even call it the getting to ready uh, PBI board. So you could take these ideas, these probably backlog items and move them through this getting to ready, you know, doing some engineering analysis, maybe some sizing if you want to, if you're a scrum team and you want to size. Um, are, is, is it, uh, you know, do some ROI analysis on those features. Um, and, and maybe is it, are those features aligned with our enterprise architectural roadmap? So there's a lot of ways to ensure that by the time something lands in the product backlog, like you're saying, Laura, it's gone through a vetting process. And maybe of the, another, another kind of somewhat radical notion in Kanban was, you know, of the things that move through that discovery board, it's, it's good to discard about half of them. And, and being a project manager and feeling like when I first landed with Scrum, I'm like, the product backlog is the single source of truth. It is the source of requirements. That's, that's a, a, a faulty thinking on my part. But uh, in, in the world of Kanban, we want to generate as many options as we can and discard about half of them so that the remaining half is really the best half. Cool. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to the slide here. So um, Matt Phillip is a uh, is St. Louis, Missouri Agile coach. Um, I, five years ago, he came up with this notion of a Kanban iceberg. Um, I started, I think I landed on, or I, I kind of started thinking about this about six months ago when I Googled it and I found Matt's stuff and I'm like, he's, he landed, he nailed it. He nailed it. So the tip of the iceberg is the board, the, the card wall, he's, so to speak, you know, it's this idea of visualizing cards, letting them move across columns, but that's like 10% of Kanban. Like that's the shallow end of the pool. The, the deeper practices involve limiting work in progress, which you can do inside of a sprint. Um, and there's a, there's a blog I wrote on, on sort of applying Kanban more specifically inside of a sprint. And we'll, we'll get that blog uh, URL to you. The, the principles, there's change principles and there's service delivery principles that are, that are both really instrumental in driving the way you think. And then just like um, Scrum, there's values. Uh, transparency, collaboration, focus, uh, flow. Um, there's a, a set of, I would say, analogous values in Kanban to the five values in Scrum. So um, anyway, and there's, then there's lastly the agendas, which kind of Matt represented as the water this iceberg is floating in. Um, you know, sustainability is sort of the first and uh, principal agenda in terms of un unburdening your team and its work. Uh, survivability is another, and then, you know, being able to thrive in the coming, uh, you know, changes in the market is, is the last one. Um, any, any comments or questions on the iceberg, Laura? Uh, nope, keep going. Okay. We, cool. we, by the way, guys, I know we have other questions that are in the queue, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to them, so no worries. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is Marley, my last slide, so we should have a little bit of time, a good time left over for some questions. So I wanted to just kind of end, end uh, sort of the lecture portion of this um, webinar with the top three ways that Kanban influences my Scrum, my thinking about how I do Scrum, um, how I bring Scrum to teams, um, and, and that sort of thing. One is, is this notion of upstream discovery. So, I mean, I came from a world of engineering. I didn't come from the world of product management. So this may seem obvious to a lot of you project managers. I mean, I'm sorry, a lot of you product managers and business people out there, but date before you decide. Like go on some dates before you decide to get married. Uh, I think it's easy to kind of, for scrum teams to kind of put things in the backlog and then they're not questioned. Um, they're maybe not challenged. They're not really rigorously looked at. And Kanban really uh, encourages a lot of rigorous discovery around the best options to generate the outcomes that your business wants to generate. So, so upstream discovery, date before you decide, is probably one of the top metaphors I bring to, um, to Scrum. And, and I, just like you said, Laura, earlier, I really encourage product owners to have their own board, a discovery board, a getting to ready board, 
um, that, that helps them to get this mentality of options and discarding stuff that they don't think is going to fit. Um, the second thing that's uh, also very important is this idea of demand analysis. So product owners are, are faced with these challenges of having to, you know, manage the needs of 10, 20, 50 stakeholders, um, plus their own ideas, plus the ideas of the CEO. Um, there's a lot of complexity to what product owners have to do. And their job is to ensure what gets built delivers value. That's like the six word job description for a product owner. And this idea of looking upstream at what's coming at you, like, like after this webinar, you can go and, and kind of reflect back on the last three months of work. Where were things coming from? Was it production support? Was it enhancements? Was it, was it shoulder taps from your stakeholders? And start to kind of get a sense of the patterns of arrival, the patterns of demand, so that you can begin to decide intentionally how to allocate that, that, uh, those demands or how to allocate those requests. Um, and this is the beginning of sort of unburdening your team and the beginning of really shaping, shaping demand, shaping upstream demand. And lastly, um, I didn't talk a lot about this, but uh, it's a pretty critical piece, uh, this idea of service. And I would point you to Matt Phillips' um, blog on service delivery review as the forgotten or the lost Scrum event. And, and the service paradigm places people uh, front and center. Now, I know that the Agile Manifesto, satisfying the customer is the very first principle of the Agile Manifesto, but I will just tell you in Scrum, as engineers use Scrum, I was an engineer for six years, we will fixate on the roles, events, and artifacts, we will, sit, we will fixate on our increments, and we will forget that there are people at the other end of uh, the, uh, who are consuming what we build. Now, if, if you have a good product owner like Kevin, Kevin Rosengren, who's a colleague of mine, he will basically take you by the elbow out to do empathy interviews with customers so that you understand what you're building is to meet someone's need as opposed to, you know, you just have fun building it. So this service paradigm is super useful um, to scrum teams. Uh, I, I bring it in the door. Um, I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a really useful way to to, I think, enliven and kind of uh, helps, help us remember uh, what Scrum is really about, which is satisfying the customer. So, Laura, I think, I'm gonna, I think that's it for my lecture. I think we got a little bit of time left for some mm -hmm. questions, if we want. Yeah, so, so um, there are a few questions here about the roles that you might see in a Kanban team. And, you know, specifically, is, you know, do you have a Scrum Master? Do you have a product owner? Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about roles and how the um, intersection between the best of scrum teams and the best of Kanban teams and how you see that the relationship between those and, and maybe some maybe misconceptions that people have about what what Kanban teams don't do right I, you know sometimes there's just some misunderstanding about you know what you, you what you do and don't do in a Kanban team. Mm -hmm. Yeah um, let me talk about roles first, and then maybe maybe if you can clarify that that second mm -hmm. part of the question, I want to make sure I understood it. Um, so so Kanban has always emphasized there are no prescribed roles, and and I've always appreciated that because they let this idea of roles emerge. And that being said, more than likely, some functions some functions are going to emerge that can be really well fulfilled by one person. So in Kanban, um, there's typically someone called a service request manager. This person um, manages the intake of requests. And this is analogous in Scrum to a product owner. Now, it doesn't have to happen that way. Um, in Scrum, there's one product owner that's, that's managing the product backlog. In Kanban, you could have a service request manager or two or three who are shared, doing, taking a shared responsibility to manage a backlog. Um, but you know, service request manager is the is the role in Kanban that works upstream of the product backlog. The the flow manager or the service delivery manager is another function in Kanban. There's no titles in Kanban, but what, what people have found is there it, it usually helps or it usually happens that someone takes over the identifying blockers and helping to helping the team to have a conscience, uh, helping the team to reflect on what it's done, uh, help facilitate meetings. That's a service delivery manager. So those are two sort of analogous roles that I would say. Um, but, but at the end of the day, Kanban really, th there's no rules 
that roles have to be a certain way, which I think some people find a little disorienting and, and scary, and some people find liberating. And there's probably going to be a blend of both of those things happening. Um, but that's, that's what I'd say about roles. So, Laura, you want to help refresh me on that, that yeah. second part of that question? Yeah, so, I mean, to, just as a reaction, I mean, a lot of what we see as well is that there are some teams that work better as a Kanban team and other, other teams, depending on what they're working on and what they're delivering, Scrum without Kanban or Scrum with a bit of Kanban might actually be a better choice. So one example that comes to mind for me is um, salespeople in my sales organization, right? We, uh -huh. we just work better as a Kanban team and it doesn't make sense for us we cannot get our heads around two week sprints in a sales organization, right? right. So, so there's, there's also like um, an opportunity to, to leverage the best agile framework for the work that is being done and they can live um, together, right? So I think what to, to refine that second part of the question that I had was, you know, what, what maybe some misconceptions are with Kanban is, you know, for example, um, you know, with a, a Kanban team, do you or do you not have a roadmap, a product roadmap? And my instinct, it not being the expert here, is that um, absolutely most companies need to have a roadmap. Kanban doesn't mean you don't know where you're going, right? It doesn't mean that you don't have a three or six or 12 month kind of view on how as an organization are you gonna meet the needs of your customer. Um, most leaders I know need to know where they're going, but that may not be true in all instances of the team that happens to be using Kanban, does it make sense to have a roadmap that shows some vision for 12 months? And right? so maybe, yeah. do you have a roadmap or not? It's one of those questions, um, you know, about are there rules in Kanban that people may not fully understand or embrace? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I love what you're bringing up, Laura. Um, if you think of a sales team, um, let me ask you as a salesperson and, and you're leading a sales team for applied frameworks, are you more interested? Are you building a product? Are you, are, what's more important to you? Increased innovation, like increased, uh, you know, creative thought or flow, flow efficiency? Which one is more important to you? Oh gosh, don't make me choose that in public. Um, <laughs> I mean, really what, what happens with what we're working on is there are some, some customers that we're working with where the, the need to be very innovative on how we help them scale agility is quite a bit different than the flow that we might want to achieve when we're looking at how do we make sure that we're offering the right training courses in the right area of the country with the right instructors with the right capacity. Right, and yeah. are we marketing those courses? Um, and, and that might be more of a flow kind of question, whereas when we're working on, um, working with some of our clients on how do we help them scale agil agility beyond a few software teams to an entire enterprise, that level yeah. of, of kind of innovation that's required means that the kind of things that we would be doing in the sales part of that really is a whole lot of consulting, right? And, and that's a different mm -hmm. problem that we're solving. And in both cases, we find Kanban to be very helpful, but we might be using it for different reasons. Yeah, yeah. We're so we're I know we're down. We're up against our time box here. Um, I, I just I just want to say, if you're trying to decide between Scrum and Kanban, ask yourself. I mean, think about the roots of Scrum. How do we build a better lawnmower? How do we build a better printer? How do we get people to innovate more um, more effectively in a tighter setting? Um, if you if you're building a product in that sense, in that creative sense, and you want to want to foster creative collaboration, Scrum can be a great place to start. Um, if, you're work, if you're looking more at day-to-day -day operations, uh, handling um, demands from multiple sources, getting things moving through your system, uh, looking for flow, I think Kanban can be a really good foundational place to start. And then, like, I'd say grab, pick and pull from each place. And uh, I, I don't know who, I mean, Corey Ladas, I think, was the founder of the term Scrumbon. And that was back in, I think, 08 or 09. So there's, there's this, for 10 years, people have been doing Scrumbon. They've been stealing gratuitously from both of these little toddlers. So uh, I would encourage you to continue to, to steal uh, gratuitously and continue to apply whatever works, whatever's going to get you to your, your definition of success is what I'd say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, thank you, Kurt, and thank you, everybody, for joining. We are up at our time, but um, I'll leave the Q&A open just a little bit longer because, again, Kurt and I love to, to go through this together, um, the Q&A, and just ask ourselves, did we answer that question in a way that makes us fully um, happy? And um, we'll summarize those in the email that comes out to you, but there, I know there are a number on here that we haven't really gotten to talk about very well, so um, we will include our thoughts on the questions that we haven't had the chance to answer. 
And, you know, beyond that, I'm telling you guys, there, I don't know anyone better than, than Kurt on how to incorporate um, the, the best of Kanban into your practices. And so we obviously do a lot of training and a lot of consulting in that area too. So please reach out to me um, directly or to, to Kurt if you have any questions about that as well. And Laura, let me close with two things. One is just pointing you to, to Matt Phillip, Andy Carmichael, Brendan Wojcicki. These have been sort of mentors of mine. Uh, Andy and Brendan personally, you know, I, I know and have co-trained with both of them. Uh, Matt's sort of been a distant uh, guy. I've met him, but I love his ideas. Patrick uh, Steyert is in Belgium, and he's the founder of Flow Lab, which is a great tool for getting a sense and a feel for flow. Um, lastly, Laura, I would say I'm working with Kevin to really build out our Kanban catalog for starting in September. Uh, we're going to be offering Kanban maturity model, uh, comma system design, um, Kanban uh, management professional certification. So we're really working towards a full, fully featured uh, catalog, and we'll let you know about how that shapes up and what's going to be available in the coming coming weeks. Sounds good. Um, all right. Well, thank you all, and you know how to reach us. And I appreciate everyone joining today. And Kurt, um, a thousand thank yous to you for putting this together and sharing with everybody kind of where where your where your thinking is today. You bet. Thanks for hosting, Laura. It's been great. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.